I'm here talking today with Dr. Martin Daly. Dr. Daly is a professor of psychology at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, and author of many influential papers on evolutionary psychology. His current research topics include an evolutionary perspective on risk-taking and interpersonal violence, especially male-male conflict, and family. He and his wife, the late Margot Wilson, were the former editors-in-chief of the journal Evolution and Human Behavior and former presidents of the Human Behavior and Evolution Society. He was named a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada in 1998. Daly is one of the main researchers of the Cinderella Effect and has been interviewed many times in the press about it. So I'm very pleased to be talking with Dr. Daly this morning. It seems to me that he's one of Canada's most outstanding psychologists and perhaps you could say that about psychologists in the world. And he's done some incredibly interesting research on the relationship between inequality and male violence and, and inequality and other topics too. So welcome, Dr. Daly. Thank you, Jordan. It's nice to be talking to you. Well, I'm looking forward to our conversation a lot. So you just wrote a book, which I'm going to show people, called Killing the Competition. And uh, I just read it. It was very interesting. So I thought... Maybe I could get you to start by talking a little bit about the book and, and also how you tell us tell us the story. That would be the, the good, a good thing to do. Well, the general issue um, that is addressed in the book is the relationship between economic inequality, which is usually indexed as income inequality, and homicide rates. And it's been known for a long time by sociologists that income inequality is the single best predictor they've got of homicide rates across countries, across states within the U.S., across cities within the U.S., and some other kinds of jurisdictional comparisons. And there's been controversy about why that is and whether inequality itself is truly the problem or whether it's just a correlate of something else. And in this book, I try to make the case that, no, inequality really is the problem. And some of the arguments that have been advanced for suggesting that it's a mere correlate of violence rather than in some way causal to violence are wrong. So can you tell us a little bit about how you calculate inequality and, and what the measure is? Yeah, income inequality. Um, there's a number of different measures that are used by economists. And I'm just borrowing the dominant ones from economists. The number one one is something called the Gini Index, G-I-N-I. I used to assume that that was some kind of uh, acronym, but actually it was the name of an Italian economist. And it's a measure that is ranges from zero to one. It would be zero if everybody had exactly the same income or exactly the same wealth if you're doing wealth inequality. And it would approach one as income or wealth was concentrated more and more in the hands of few and then a single individual and in principle would go to one in the extreme if all wealth were held by Bill Gates and none of the rest of us had anything. And now you analyze the, the Gini coefficient at different levels of, of jurisdiction. Eh? So I noted in your work that you've looked at countries and states uh, within countries and I think that's particularly true in the US. So tell us a little bit about what you found yeah, well, with within the U.S., and again, this has been known by sociologists um, for some time, within the U.S. and cross-nationally, um, the Gini coefficient is a very good predictor of homicide. The correlation tends to be on the order of 0.7 in many studies, which means that the variance in either measure, 50% of it could be accounted for by the variability in the other measure, um, what I'm saying between homicide and income inequality. And actually, um, it even works on a neighborhood level. My late wife, Margot, and I published some analyses in Chicago that showed that income inequality was a very strong predictor of homicide rates across neighborhoods within Chicago. Tell us a little bit about what you did in Chicago, because that, that research is extremely interesting, and also when you did it. Um, let's see. We did our work in Chicago in the early 90s, and at that time, um, Chicago had very high homicide rate, not the worst in the United States, but one of the worst in the United States, and in fact had more homicides every year than the whole of Canada, which makes it a substantial enough phenomenon that you can sort of look for causal factors or correlates without a lot of stochastic noise. Um, 
in Chicago, Chicago is divided up into some 77, I believe, neighborhoods uh, by there's a longstanding tradition of urban sociology in Chicago, and there's these sort of well-recognized 77 neighborhoods. And anyway, for these neighborhoods, we were able to amass a variety of neighborhood-specific information, including on income distributions, on homicides, and so forth, um, working with the Chicago police, who were collaborators in some of this work. And Margot um, went to the Illinois Department of Health to try and get information on other death rates and birth rates and demographic structure of each of the neighborhoods. And she wanted to compute the life expectancy because the idea that she had was that local life expectancy would affect the extent to which people were willing to sort of escalate dangerously in competitive situations. In competitive, and that was our construal of what most homicides in Chicago were about, were guys killing each other when dissed in bars, um, circumstances in which there's some sort of competition and it gets dangerous. And our basic idea there and elsewhere has been that a lot of the variability in homicide rates, the most violent, volatile component of homicide rates, has to do with this male-male competition and where, where and when does it get dangerous and where or when does it sort of dampen down. And for Chicago, anyway, the Illinois Department of Health had never, nobody had ever computed neighborhood specific life expectancy, but the data were available to do it, age specific mortality and so on was available to do it. And so we computed age specific life expectancies, income inequality, and many other variables that uh, criminologists have considered relevant in past studies, racial heterogeneity and blah, blah, blah. And tried to see what were your best predictors of homicide. And in that particular study, everywhere else we've worked, we've mostly found income inequality to be number one. In that particular study, income inequality was a very good predictor, but the best predictor was male life expectancy um, at age at birth or at age 15. And in order to compute, like, of course you say homicide rates, homicide reduces male life expectancy. So you have to remove homicide statistically as a cause of death and say life expectancy net of the impact of homicide, that was our best predictor of homicide rate. So life expectancy is very variable in the city of Chicago and I assume in other US cities. I mean, in the worst neighborhoods, male life expectancy at birth was down in the 50s, as bad as in the worst countries in the world. In the best neighborhoods, male life expectancy was up in the, I think was over 80 um, or in the high 70s in any case. Um, corresponding to what you might expect in Scandinavia or the places with the best life expectancy in the world. So it's a huge range. That was our best predictor. Then if you try and do a multivariate analysis where you look for, well, what else predicts some the residual variability? And there wasn't much residual variability. The second best, indeed the only secondary predictor that seemed to be statistically significant was income inequality across the neighborhoods. That was that was the thrust of our, our study in Chicago. And I'd love to see more work on life expectancy as a predictor of violence. Um, of the Université de Montréal a criminologist, Marc Wimet, tried to do the same thing in, in Montreal, but he found that in Montreal, the difference in life expectancy for men between the worst and the best neighborhoods was only six years, whereas in Chicago, it was 24. Four years, I think. So, so what, do you, uh, what do you think accounted for the vast difference in life expectancy between Chicago and Montreal? And was life expectancy itself associated with income inequality? Oh, yes. I mean, that's part of the problem, of course, in all this kind of research here. It's not experimental research. You don't control independent variables and everything of potential interest is correlated with everything else. So, you know, income inequality alone accounts for more than half the variance in homicide rates across Chicago neighborhoods. So does life expectancy alone. Um, so does percent below the poverty line alone. Um, you know, but right. these things are all correlated with each other. And so trying to tease apart what's most important is okay. tricky. Well, so, um, so the, 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 low, the low life expectancy in Chicago neighborhoods is not due to violence. It's due to it's it's due overwhelmingly to differential disease. Um, in Chicago, you know, privatization of medicine in the U.S. was so extreme that at the time we were doing this research, emergency rooms in the worst neighborhoods in Chicago had closed down because they'd gone bankrupt. Um, they didn't have enough money to remain open, and therefore, if you got stabbed or shot in a bad neighborhood in Chicago, you had to be 
transported somewhere else to try and keep you alive because there was, you know, the hospitals had shut their emergency rooms um, or had shut down completely. So there's all sorts of factors that contribute to, uh, to differential death rates. But, you know, kids in the worst neighborhood are exposed to high levels of lead. Um, there's some evidence that lead exposure in childhood is a big predictor of um, variability in life expectancy. Um, all kinds of internal diseases, they were more susceptible to the effects of bad nutrition, they were more susceptible to. So if you, if you divide causes of death into so-called external causes, which basically means homicides, suicides, and accidents, and internal causes, which is more or less synonymous with what we ordinarily think of as disease, internal causes were still the biggest source of differential mortality across neighborhoods. So you could make... By the sounds of it, you could make a reasonable case that the sa social safety net in Canada is flattening out the bottom of the, of the income distribution, especially the provision of health care. And you know, I also re um, was informed a while back uh, that the rate of entrepreneurship in Canada is actually higher than in, than in the U.S. And part of the reason for that is that because health care is provided, people can take a risk of walking away from their jobs without putting their family completely at risk. And so one of the perverse effects of socialized medicine is that it elevates the rates of entrepreneurship. So I also wanted to mention, you know, your, your work was absolutely striking to me because of the effect sizes. Now, it, for people who don't know about uh, how, how to compare effect sizes, I should point out that you never see a correlation of 0.7 between any two variables in the social sciences. So there's a guy named Hemphill who did an empirical analysis of effect size comparisons uh, about four or five years ago. It might be longer than that now. And he concluded that 95% of social science studies had an uh, effect size of 0.5 or less. And so to see a correlation of 0.7 is absolutely overwhelming when you also take into account that measurement error is decreasing the, the potency of the relationship to some degree. So that's the And when you take into account that... Uh, that those uh, though that point five represent studies that were published because they got something. Yes, exactly, exactly. So, so point seven is absolutely overwhelming. I've never seen effect sizes that big between two variables of interest in any other domain that I can recall. And then the other thing that that's worth pointing out, and, and we can talk about this a little bit too, is the other thing that's so radical about your research is that it. And, and this this what emerges out of the out of the manner in which the Gini coefficient is is calculated because it's only a measure of relative poverty, um, and it's the predictor. You you also generated data indicating that places where everyone was relatively poor or say relatively working class, like North Dakota and some of the Canadian provinces, had very low homicide rates, and also places where everyone was rich. Right, so to re reiterate, what you're seeing is that what's driving male homicide is the existence, and for, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, the existence of a steep economic dominance hierarchy that makes it difficult for the young men to obtain status through what you might describe as conventional and socially productive means. And so instead, they turn to violence as a means of establishing status. And most of that's within race and between young men jockeying for position. Is that all correct? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a pretty fair characterization. Um, it's, it's worth stressing, yes, that income inequality is in principle and in practice dissociable from just average income or, or percent below the poverty line or other measures of so-called absolute uh, deprivation. They're often correlated. Um, right. You know, income inequality across a certain set of jurisdictions may be fairly strongly correlated with um, the percent below the poverty line, for example, it would be surprising if it was not usually correlated. But uh, but they're not necessarily, as you said. Yeah, so you demonstrated, or you were one of the first people to demonstrate, were you the first, in fact, maybe, that it wasn't poverty that was causing this kind of crime, it was relative poverty. And that, that changes the interpretation of the situation absolutely dramatically. So tell us a little bit about why you think the males are competing in, in this deadly manner? What's driving that behavior? Well, it's very interesting. I think, I think men are sensitive to, are interested in relative position, status, um, maintaining face in competitive milieus. And you know, in a sense, all milieus are a bit competitive. Um, and the willingness to use violence partly 
can be thought of as kind of a disdain for the future or I want mine now. Um, I'm willing to do something that threatens my life, like escalate in competition or not back down or not walk away from an insult. Um, because I'm, I'm thinking very short term, um, the rewards for for being passive, you know, if, you, if you're if you're a nice, um, prosperous university student of age 20, you have good life prospects, your chances for eventually becoming well paid, um, maybe people will laugh at this are still reasonably good, your chances for eventually marrying are still reasonably good. If you're the same age kind of guy um, in a urban ghetto with a 48% unemployment rate or something like that, then you have very much more, and, and with uncertainty about the stability of whatever income you do get with, with um, the future unknown, then you're more willing to take a risk now in the pursuit of status now, in the pursuit of sexual opportunity now, in the pursuit of monetary rewards, legal or illicit now, and also the maintenance of face, like social reputation is the one resource you've got. If you've got other resources, you can walk away from threats or, or disrespect um, and, and reap your rewards later. If social status is all you've got, then it becomes an important thing to defend. So I read some research a while back that looked at the relationship between socioeconomic status among men and number of sexual partners and also socioeconomic status among women and number of sexual partners. And that's another domain where you see these kinds of whopping correlations. So the correlation between socioeconomic status for men and number of available sexual partners is about 0.6 or 0.7, whereas for women it's negative 0.12. And so do you think, so do you think that it's reasonable to assume that either at the phylogenetic level, level or the ontogenetic level, e either evolutionarily speaking or even as a consequence of rational calculation, that part of the reason that men, or perhaps the main reason that men are engaging in these status competitions is because of female hypergamy? Is that, um, a, reasonable, is that a reasonable hypothesis? Hypergamy, and as you say, si um, simple access. I mean, there, there is... There, the, the association that you mentioned is presumably a very long-standing one. That is to say that men of, with status and resources have had access to partners for sure and probably multiple partners simultaneously or serially um, to a degree that men of lower status have not. There's high variance in eventual reproduction among males in mammals generally and although the situation is less extreme in people than in many other mammals. The same is true for people. I mean, when you say they have high variance compared to what? Well, high variance compared to women, for example. Mm -hmm. um, the variability in eventual reproductive success is lower for women than for men and, or has been. Now, you say s sexual access to women, and I think that's exactly the right level to be looking at in contemporary societies. But the reason why that matters is because ancestrally that translated into differential reproduction right. in a modern environment in which, you know, contraceptive technology is available, especially to women, then, uh, then that correlation may be broken down. But the motives to seek sexual opportunity um, remain relevant. So one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, too, is the, like you, you, you made a comment in your book about Adrian Raines, and Adrian Raines has written a book recently about the biological predictors of criminality. And you make a strong case that, in, in some sense, the, the, the turning to violence that's characteristic of men in uncertain situations is rational because it drives, it actually legitimately drives status increase, and that produces a yeah. variety of positive effects. So it, in some sense, it's a rational response to a radically uncertain environment where competition is high. Now, Reigns would say... Welcome to the Jordan B. Peterson podcast. To support these podcasts, you can donate to Dr. Peterson's Patreon account, the link to which can be found in the description. Dr. Peterson's self-development programs, self-authoring, can be found at selfauthoring.com. I'm here talking today with Dr. Martin Daly, 
Dr. Daly is a professor of psychology at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, and author of many influential papers on evolutionary psychology. His current research topics include an evolutionary perspective on risk-taking and interpersonal violence, especially male-male conflict and family. He and his wife, the late Margot Wilson, were the former editors-in-chief of the journal Evolution and Human Behavior and former presidents of the Human Behavior and Evolution Society. He was named a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada in 1998. Daly is one of the main researchers of the Cinderella effect and has been interviewed many times in the press about it. So I'm very pleased to be talking with Dr. Daly this morning. It seems to me that he's one of Canada's most outstanding psychologists and perhaps you could say that about psychologists in the world. And he's done some incredibly interesting research on the relationship between inequality and male violence and, and inequality and other topics too. So. Welcome, Dr. Daly. Thank you, Jordan. It's nice to be talking to you. Well, I'm looking forward to our conversation a lot. So you just wrote a book, which I'm going to show people, called Killing the Competition. And uh, I just read it. It was very interesting. So I thought maybe I could get you to start by talking a little bit about the book and, and also how you tell us tell us the story. That would be the, the good a good thing to do. Well, the general issue um, that is addressed in the book is the relationship between economic inequality, which is usually indexed as income inequality, and homicide rates. And it's been known for a long time by sociologists that income inequality is the single best predictor they've got of homicide rates across countries, across states within the U.S., across cities within the U.S., and some other kinds of jurisdictional comparisons. And there's been controversy about why that is and whether inequality itself is truly the problem or whether it's just a correlate of something else. And in this book, I try to make the case that no, inequality really is the problem. And some of the arguments that have been advanced for suggesting that it's a mere correlate of violence rather than in some way causal to violence are wrong. So can you tell us a little bit about how you calculate inequality and, and what the measure is? Yeah, income inequality, um, there's a number of different measures that are used by economists, and I'm just borrowing the dominant ones from economists. The number one one is something called the Gini Index, G-I-N-I. I used to assume that that was some kind of uh, acronym, but actually it was the name of an Italian economist. And it's a measure that is ranges from zero to one. It would be zero if everybody had exactly the same income or exactly the same wealth if you're doing wealth inequality. And it would approach one as income or wealth was concentrated more and more in the hands of few and then a single individual. And in principle would go to one in the extreme if all wealth were held by Bill Gates and none of the rest of us had anything. And now you analyze the, the Gini coefficient at different levels of, of jurisdiction. Eh? So I noted in your work that you've looked at countries and states uh, within countries, and I think that's particularly true in the U.S. So tell us a little bit about what you found. Yeah, well, with within the U.S., and again, this has been known by sociologists um, for some time, within the U.S. and cross-nationally, um, the Gini coefficient is a very good predictor of homicide. The correlation tends to be on the order of 0.7 in many studies, which means that the variance in either measure, 50% of it could be accounted for by the variability in the other measure, um, what I'm saying between homicide and income inequality. And actually, um, it even works on a neighborhood level. My late wife, Margot, and I published some analyses in Chicago that showed that income inequality was a very strong predictor of homicide rates across neighborhoods within Chicago. Tell us a little bit about what you did in Chicago, because that, that research is extremely interesting, and also when you did it. Um, Let's see, we did our work in Chicago in the early 90s, and at that time, um, Chicago had a very high homicide rate, not the worst in the United States, but one of the worst in the United States, and in fact had more homicides every year than the whole of Canada, which makes it a substantial enough phenomenon that you can sort of look for causal factors or correlates without a lot of stochastic noise. Um, 
in Chicago, Chicago is divided up into some 77, I believe, neighborhoods uh, by there's a longstanding tradition of urban sociology in Chicago, and there's these sort of well-recognized 77 neighborhoods. And anyway, for these neighborhoods, we were able to amass a variety of neighborhood-specific information, including on income distributions, on homicides, and so forth, um, working with the Chicago police, who were collaborators in some of this work. And Margot um, went to the Illinois Department of Health to try and get information on other death rates and birth rates and demographic structure of each of the neighborhoods. And she wanted to compute the life expectancy because the idea that she had was that local life expectancy would affect the extent to which people were willing to sort of escalate dangerously in competitive situations. In competitive, and that was our construal of what most homicides in Chicago were about, were guys killing each other when dissed in bars, um, circumstances in which there's some sort of competition and it gets dangerous. And our basic idea there and elsewhere has been that a lot of the variability in homicide rates, the most volatile component of homicide rates, has to do with this male-male competition and where, where and when does it get dangerous and where or when does it sort of dampen down. And for Chicago, anyway, the Illinois Department of Health had never, nobody had ever computed neighborhood specific life expectancy, but the data were available to do it, age specific mortality and so on was available to do it. And so we computed age specific life expectancies, income inequality, and many other variables that uh, criminologists have considered relevant in past studies, racial heterogeneity and blah, blah, blah. And tried to see what were your best predictors of homicide. And in that particular study, everywhere else we've worked, we've mostly found income inequality to be number one. In that particular study, income inequality was a very good predictor, but the best predictor was male life expectancy um, at age at birth or at age 15. And in order to compute, like, of course, you say homicide rates, homicide reduces male life expectancy. So you have to remove homicide statistically as a cause of death and say life expectancy net of the impact of homicide, that was our best predictor of homicide rates. So life expectancy is very variable in the city of Chicago and I assume in other US cities. I mean, in the worst neighborhoods, male life expectancy at birth was down in the 50s as bad as in the worst countries in the world. In the best neighborhoods, male life expectancy was up in the, I think was over 80 um, or in the high 70s in any case. Um, corresponding to what you might expect in Scandinavia or the places with the best life expectancy in the world. So it's a huge range. That was our best predictor. Then if you try and do a multivariate analysis where you look for, well, what else predicts some the residual variability? And there wasn't much residual variability. The second best, indeed the only secondary predictor that seemed to be statistically significant was income inequality across the neighborhoods. That was that was the thrust of our, our study in Chicago. And I'd love to see more work on life expectancy as a predictor of violence. Um, of Université de Montréal, a criminologist, Marc Wimain, tried to do the same thing in, in Montreal, but he found that in Montreal, the difference in life expectancy for men between the worst and the best neighborhoods was only six years, whereas in Chicago, it was 24 years, I think. So, what, so do you, uh, what do you think accounted for the vast difference in life expectancy between Chicago and Montreal? And was life expectancy itself associated with income inequality? Oh, yes. I mean, that's part of the problem, of course, in all this kind of research here. It's not experimental research. You don't control independent variables and everything of potential interest is correlated with everything else. So, you know, income inequality alone accounts for more than half the variance in homicide rates across Chicago neighborhoods. So does life expectancy alone. Um, so does percent below the poverty line alone. Um, you know, but these right. things are all correlated with each other. And so trying to tease apart what's most important is okay. tricky. Well, so, um, so the, 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 low, the low life expectancy in Chicago neighborhoods is not due to violence. It's due to it's it's due overwhelmingly to differential disease um, in Chicago. You know, privatization of medicine in the U.S. was so extreme that at the time we were doing this research, emergency rooms in the worst neighborhoods in Chicago had closed down because they got bankrupt. Um, they didn't have enough money to remain open. And therefore, if you got stabbed or shot in a bad neighborhood in Chicago, you had to be 
transported somewhere else to try and keep you alive because there was, you know, the hospitals had shut their emergency rooms um, or had shut down completely. So there's all sorts of factors that contribute to, uh, to differential death rates. But, you know, kids in the worst neighborhood are exposed to high levels of lead. Um, there's some evidence that lead exposure in childhood is a big predictor of um, variability in life expectancy. Um, all kinds of internal diseases, they were more susceptible to the effects of bad nutrition, they were more susceptible to. So if you, if you divide causes of death into so-called external causes, which basically means homicides, suicides, and accidents, and internal causes, which is more or less synonymous with what we ordinarily think of as disease, Internal causes were still the biggest source of differential mortality across neighborhoods. So you could make, by the sounds of it, you could make a reasonable case that the social safety net in Canada is flattening out the bottom of the of the income distribution, especially the provision of health care. And you know, I also re um, was informed a while back uh, that the rate of entrepreneurship in Canada is actually higher than in than in the U.S. and part of the reason for that is that because health care is provided, people can take a risk of walking away from their jobs without putting their family completely at risk. And so one of the perverse effects of socialized medicine is that it elevates the rates of entrepreneurship. So I also wanted to mention, you know, your, your work was absolutely striking to me because of the effect sizes. Now, it, for people who don't know about uh, how to compare effect sizes, I should point out that you never see a correlation of 0.7 between any two variables in the social sciences. So there's a guy named Hemphill who did an empirical analysis of effect size comparisons uh, about four or five years ago. It might be longer than that now. And he concluded that 95% of social science studies had an uh, effect size of 0.5 or less. And so to see a correlation of 0.7 is absolutely overwhelming when you also take into account that measurement error is decreasing the, the potency of the relationship to some degree. So that's the and when you take into account that uh, that those uh, th that point five represents studies that were published because they got something. Yes, exactly, exactly. So so point seven is absolutely overwhelming. I've never seen effect sizes that big between two variables of interest in any other domain that I can recall. And then the other thing that, that's worth pointing out, and, and we can talk about this a little bit too, is the other thing that's so radical about your research is that it and, and this this what emerges out of the out of the manner in which the Gini coefficient is is calculated, because it's only a measure of relative poverty, um, and it's the predictor. You you also generated data indicating that places where everyone was relatively poor, or say relatively working class, like North Dakota and some of the Canadian provinces, had very low homicide rates, and also places where everyone was rich. Right, so to re reiterate, what you're seeing is that what's driving male homicide is the existence, and for, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, the existence of a steep economic dominance hierarchy that makes it difficult for the young men to obtain status through what you might describe as conventional and socially productive means. And so instead, they turn to violence as a means of establishing status. And most of that's within race and between young men jockeying for position. Is that all correct? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a pretty fair characterization. Um, it's, it's worth stressing, yes, that income inequality is in principle and in practice dissociable from just average income or, or percent below the poverty line or other measures of so-called absolute uh, deprivation. They're often correlated. Um, right. You know, income inequality across a certain set of jurisdictions may be fairly strongly correlated with um, the percent below the poverty line, for example, it would be surprising if it was not usually correlated. But uh, but they're not necessarily, as you said. Yeah, so you demonstrated, or you were one of the first people to demonstrate, were you the first, in fact, maybe, that it wasn't poverty that was causing this kind of crime, it was relative poverty. And that, that changes the interpretation of the situation absolutely dramatically. So tell us a little bit about why you think the males are competing in, in this deadly manner? What's driving that behavior? Well, it's very interesting. I think, I think men are sensitive to, are interested in relative position, status, um, maintaining face in competitive milieus. And you know, in a sense, all milieus are a bit competitive. Um, and 
the willingness to use bio, it's partly can be thought of as kind of a disdain for the future or I want mine now. Um, I'm willing to do something that threatens my life, like escalate in competition or not back down or not walk away from an insult. Um, because I'm, I'm thinking very short term, um, the rewards for for being passive, you know, if, you, if you're if you're a nice, um, prosperous university student of age 20, you have good life prospects. Your chances for eventually becoming well paid, um, maybe people will laugh at this, are still reasonably good. Your chances for eventually marrying are still reasonably good. If you're the same age kind of guy um, in a urban ghetto with a 48% unemployment rate or something like that, then you have very much more, and, and with uncertainty about the stability of whatever income you do get with, with um, the future unknown, then you're more willing to take a risk now in the pursuit of status now, in the pursuit of sexual opportunity now, in the pursuit of monetary rewards, legal or illicit now. And also the maintenance of face, like social reputation is the one resource you've got if you've got other resources, you can walk away from threats or or disrespect um, and and reap your rewards later. If social status is all you've got, then it becomes an important thing to defend. So I read some research a while back that looked at the relationship between socioeconomic status among men and number of sexual partners and also socioeconomic status among women and number of sexual partners and that's another domain where you see these kinds of whopping correlations so the correlation between socioeconomic status for men and number of available sexual partners is about 0.6 or 0.7 whereas for women it's negative 0.12 and so do you think so do you think that it's reasonable to assume that either at the phylogenetic level, level or the ontogenetic level, e either evolutionarily speaking or even as a consequence of rational calculation, that part of the reason that men, or perhaps the main reason that men are engaging in these status competitions is because of female hypergamy? Is that, um, a, reasonable, is that a reasonable hypothesis? Hypergamy, and as you say, si um, simple access. I mean, there, there is... There, the, the association that you mentioned is presumably a very long-standing one. That is to say that men of, with status and resources have had access to partners for sure and probably multiple partners simultaneously or serially um, to a degree that men of lower status have not. There's high variance in eventual reproduction among males in mammals generally and although the situation is less extreme in people than in many other mammals. The same is true for people. I mean, when you say they have high variance compared to what? Well, high variance compared to women, for example. Mm -hmm. um, the variability in eventual reproductive success is lower for women than for men and, or has been. Now, you say sexual access to women, and I think that's exactly the right level to be looking at in contemporary societies. But the reason why that matters is because ancestrally that translated into differential reproduction right. in a modern environment in which, you know, contraceptive technology is available, especially to women, then, uh, then that correlation may be broken down. But the motives to seek sexual opportunity um, remain relevant. So one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, too, is the, like you, you, you made a comment in your book about Adrian Raines. And Adrian Raines has written a book recently about the biological predictors of criminality. And you make a strong case that, in, in some sense, the, the, the turning to violence that's characteristic of men in uncertain situations is rational because it drives, it actually legitimately drives status increase, and that produces a yeah. variety of positive effects. So it, in some sense, it's a rational response to a radically uncertain environment where competition is high. Now, Reigns would say, and the biological type researchers, they, they, look at, they look more at the individual level and conclude that it's individuals who have various forms of prefrontal damage or, or characterological issues um, associated with antisocial personality disorder that are more likely to engage in violent acts. And you can track that. I mean, Richard Tromley has done some of this work in Quebec. 
you can track the emergence of aggression at an individual level all the way back to children at two years of age because it turns out that children who are two are the most violent children, particularly the boys, but mostly a subset of boys who, who kick, fight, hit, and bite, and steal at two most of whom are socialized by the age of four, but a subset of whom are not socialized and then they become, they're more likely to become the lifetime offenders. And, and so what I'm wondering is maybe you can reconcile the difference between the two research um, streams like this. Imagine that as the economic gradient increases and the dominance hierarchy becomes steeper and steeper, the men who are prone to be violent um, like it's the disagreeable men that start to be violent first maybe yeah. the ones that have an impulse control problem or that are characterologically like like the violent two-year-olds that are characterologically predisposed to be violent it seems to me that those would be the ones that you know as the pressure increases those men who are more prone to violence for other reasons are going to be the people who react with violence first do you think that's a reasonable hypothesis yeah, no, I think that's a very reasonable hypothesis. And I mean, my objection to Adrian Raid's book was um, that I think he vast, you know, he, he's, there's definitely evidence that many kinds of uh, violent criminal offenders have got something wrong with their brains. Adrian Raid wants to extrapolate to the conclusion that violent criminals, and indeed criminals in general, have got something broken about their brains. And it's like criminality is pathological. Well, criminality is not pathological. People steal for cost-benefit related reasons. Um, the crime is a, if you like, God help us, social construction in the sense that um, certain behaviors are criminalized by a larger social group in order to deter them because self-interested individuals would otherwise pursue them. You know, how do you make people stop exploiting others, stealing from others um, by criminalizing those activities and imposing penalties. And, you know, there's a rational choice um, stream of theorizing within criminology that, that other people like Adrian Ray just dismiss out of hand. No, no, criminal offenses are pathological. Yeah. And, and I think that's silly. Well, it seems unnecessary. You know, that, because it isn't yes. that difficult to make a marriage between the two issues. Like one of the best predictors, you know, I do research on individual differences in personality and the best personality predictor of incarceration is low agreeableness. And that's yeah. one of the dimensions on which men and women differ the most. And so as you become more disagreeable, you become more self-oriented. I would say, and that can push past the point where you're so self-interested that you're willing to prey on others. And so those are the guys that, as well as the guys who lack impulse control, those are the guys, the first guys to turn to violence, let's say, when the socioeconomic conditions become sufficiently unstable so that a conscientious approach is not tenable. Yeah, and, then, and, still, and the marriage between that kind of thinking and and thinking about the relevance of inequality is that there's guys at the top who are like the violent people you describe. There's people doing very well who are very happy to exploit others. But the costs of individual violent action are high enough and the opportunities to exploit other people through financial means, through your lawyers, um, through whatever tactics are available to, you know, well-heeled bullies are are safe enough that they opt to, to behave in those directions. Right, because they've got a, they, they, their long-term future is relatively stable, and so that long-term planning and regulation of behavior actually play a, an important economic role. And, and you know, and then in, in the case of somebody like Donald Trump, I mean, he looks like somebody who's suffering a little bit of an impulse control problem, especially sort of during the night when he wakes up and his, his Twitter account is too close at hand. But he's he's rich enough to bully people in other ways that actually heads on violence. Although, come to think of it, uh, the famous remark that he made during the campaign about women um, suggests perhaps that you know it depends on your definition of heads on violence. I guess that qualifies. Okay, so um, there's a very large body of research that indicates that alcohol is a major contributor to criminality too, especially with regards to men. Um, 
and so about 50% of people who are murdered have a decent blood alcohol level and about 50% of murderers. And I think that's partly, that stat is equal, equalizes, I think, because much violence among men is exactly the sort that you describe, where it's a status dispute and it's more or less a toss-up who's going to come out as a winner. But then I guess what's happening with alcohol perhaps is that because it's a disinhibitor, because it reduces anxiety, and, and anxiety is one of the suppressors of aggressive behavior, that men who are already on the edge, let's say, because of the unstable environment and the steep dominance hierarchy are also more likely to lose control when they're drinking. And maybe that's also fueled. This is something, too, that I'm curious about. I mean, you can think about it as a rational calculation, but, but I'm also curious about the degree to which it's fueled by emergent negative emotions. So it's yeah. easy for people who are in... Uh, steep dominance hierarchies to regard the system as unfair and to become resentful and, and angry about it, as, as perhaps they should be. I'm not suggesting that that's necessarily an irrational response, but it, it seems that if the anger is simmering underneath the surface, that it's waiting in some sense for an opportunity to break free, and alcohol in a bar or at home perhaps provides that, that, that route. Yeah, I uh, what you say makes evident sense to me. I mean, it's probably worth injecting a bit of a caution about the word rationality generally. When one talks about um, rationality in crime, but perhaps especially in confrontational violence, the point is not that the person is making good and carefully weighed decisions. I mean, I think, you know, emotions are the handmaid of what I would call ecological rationality. They They help you know how you should feel about certain things and how you should react to them. And the rationality claim is more a claim of this person gets riled up, resents X, and, there, and he should. There's good reason to get riled up and resent X. But the fact that alcohol perhaps disinhibits so that, you know, the, the truly rational balance between inhibitory and aggressive emotions is altered the idea that ration, that alcohol um, interferes with with cognitive processes to the point that people are, start making stupid decisions when they're drunk, um, right. decide to get behind the wheel or whatever. I think this plays very heavily into the reason why so many homicides tend to happen in contexts like two drunks insulting each other and or you know people who are somewhat under the influence of alcohol insulting each other rather than. Uh, you know, if you if you have more if you have more mental wherewithal at the moment, you probably have better capacities to confuse da to to defuse dangerous situations through, um, you know, ways that don't entail losing face by by being articulate. Um, Great, exactly. That's right. You have other tools at your disposal rather than immediate recourse to your fists. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, if I remember correctly, too, in your Chicago studies, this is one of the things that I found particularly fascinating, was you track the consequences of killing someone in Chicago. And the consequences were something of the following sort. Well, first of all, you were likely to be charged with something like second-degree murder. It would be difficult for the police to find people to testify against you. And if they did, generally what they would say is that it was a two-way altercation. And so... In many cases, you could plead self-defense. Often it didn't go before a jury because the perpetrator plea bargained it down to manslaughter. The sentence was something on the, on the order of a couple of years, and people were generally out of prison in 18 months with a substantial boost in their social capital because now they were like dangerous sons of bitches not to be messed with, and that was quite clear, and also perhaps also improved, so to speak, by their sojourn in prison. Is that is, if I got that right? Um, except for one detail. Well, actually, in our Chicago studies, we didn't have as good follow-up information as what you're talking about. This this was an earlier piece of research in the city of Detroit that uh, wow. that led to most of those findings. But uh, but yeah, exactly. Um, hardly. It's interesting. We had a we had a single year sample of cases in Detroit, and there were I think. 590 homicides in Detroit in that one year, 1972, at which time Detroit did have the highest homicide rate in the U.S. A, a large majority of these are male-male disputes of some sort. Um, 
status disputes usually, but sometimes robberies. And just as you said, um, witnesses are unlikely to come forward, and the prosecutors are stretched. They don't have right. they don't have um, the resources that they would need to pursue every case, and so they. Many cases were dismissed. I mean, not even prosecuted, never mind plea bargain. Something like approximately half of all male, male, macho dispute homicides in Detroit that were solved were not prosecuted on the expectation that there was a plausible self-defense argument that might, mm -hmm. you know, win with a jury. Then of the half that were prosecuted, almost all of them, yeah, were plea bargained down to manslaughter, and the majority of them got a conviction. It's right. It's Three years, 50% time off for good behavior. If you behave nicely, you go to Jackson State Prison in Michigan. Um, 18 months later, you're back out on the streets of Detroit. And Margot in particular was very interested in the question of whether killing in these contexts might even actually ultimately pay off for guys. I tend to the view that actually killing is, an, is overstepping the bounds of utility. Um, that, that That's deadly, reassuring that deadly threats are very self-interested and effectual, mm -hmm. but that when you, but, but that actually following through on them is maybe, be, you know, the, the non-functional tip of the iceberg. But I honestly don't know that that's true in these kind of cases for the, for exactly this reason that um, guys get some social capital out of having yeah. done it. Well, hypothetically among the Yanomamo, the, the tribe tribes in, in, in South America and South America, I believe, or Central, I think it's South America. South America. Yeah. 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 The, the more warlike men have a much higher uh, reproduction rate, the ones who've killed more. Now, I don't know, obviously, it isn't necessarily the case that that's directly translatable, but there is some utility in being a successful warrior. It's, that's actually one of the reasons that I think that, that capitalism, so to speak, is underappreciated, because in, in, in a very, I'm speaking in a very specific sense, is that there are disagreeable and warlike men um, and some of them are very powerful in many ways, not only physically, but intellectually and characterologically and, and with, with great ambition. And the thing about capitalism is that it enables them to wage war in a manner that's, that's not deadly and to become successful that way and, and to channel their, their, their in, intense competitive energy into something that, well, I think it often is often for a social good. Now, it depends on how disagreeable the person is and how selfish they are, of course, but people like that also tend to get punished in their, in their cooperative interactions with other people. Yeah, I, I mean, I partly agree, but I also feel that the often toward the social good is a bit hopeful. I mean, um, to the degree that people are successful in a fairly unrestrained capitalist um, competition, it's usually at the expense of large numbers of uh, people at the bottom. But it depends how unrestrained that capitalist competition yeah, well, is. I was thinking of social good as in better than war. Yeah, you know, better than you know, war for right, sure. Right, better than that, war for sure. And sometimes, and sometimes the way you succeed is by producing goods that actually make people's lives better. Um, no quarrel with that. So now I also wanted to ask you, I, in the last couple of chapters of your book, you turned to what I would regard as more political issues. And so I, I, and I, I am, I'm very interested in inequality because we'll recapit recapitulate for a minute. So your work and the work of other people seems to indicate that as inequality increases and dominance hierarchies get steeper, not only do young men get more violent and so society becomes less stable, but there's also detrimental impacts on things like population health and 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 that are and that was that was documented quite nicely in the spirit level. And so I'm going to uh, address a couple of criticisms of the research, and and then I want to ask you. I want to have a discussion about your your more prescriptive views, if that's okay. So yeah. so the first issue. Someone just emailed me this a while back, and when I was talking about inequality, and they said, "Well, what about places like China, where?" the rates of inequality are starting to skyrocket quite substantially and have been for, you know, several years, maybe maybe several decades. Yet the the homicide rate doesn't seem to be budging much. And so I thought, well, that was interesting. Maybe there's something different about East Asian communities. Uh, they tend to have very low crime rates to begin with, uh, like places like Japan, for example, have very low crime rates. And so I'm wondering if what you think about that, is that a reasonable criticism and, and how would you address it? Fair enough. Um, 
Well, I don't, I don't think we can characterize, you know, Orientals as less violent than Occidentals or anything like that. I think, you know, history tells us otherwise that uh, there's been a lot of severe and dangerous violence in Japan in history and in China in history. I don't know how good data we have on Chinese homicide rates, but what I've seen is that they have been going up a bit lately. Um, But still, the point that inequality has been skyrocketing. I mean, partly there's an interesting question about time lags and mm-hmm. the effects of, right. on people. You know, how, how soon is an increased inequality effect going to play out as nasty interpersonal behavior? Um, and, you know, people respond to inequality as a result of their lifetime experiences. You know, you were talking about young kids, already very young children already being predictable in the extent to which they're willing to, you know, use violent tactics against other people and that, you know, assaying three and four year olds could give you some surprisingly good prediction of how they'll behave as adults. It's not inconceivable that the effects of inequality even are influencing people's development prenatally. Uh, and so, you know, the uterine environments that they experience as a function of, of inequitable environments and the stresses and fraught social comparisons and so on that happen in those environments could be influencing them at all life stages. So I don't think we have any strong basis for expecting rapid change in inequality to be accompanied in the short term by rapid change in violence. Um, that said, there, you know, it's certainly the case that there's other things that matter. And Government controls are one. Um, I think I think strong governments that monopolize the legitimate use of violence can keep a lid on violence for a long time. Um, I you know I I would question whether they can keep a lid on it indefinitely, but they could keep a lid on it for a long time. If you if you execute all charged murderers. Um, I presume that that would keep the incidents of murder down, and not only because those people could be recidivists. Right. So, so there's an element potentially of authoritarian control. Yeah. And then the other I element think so. that I think is 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 particularly interesting is the time lag argument. I mean, we, you don't know over what period of time precisely inequality has its pernicious effects, and maybe it's not even the span of one lifetime. In it, I, I, do, do you have any data on that that, that would help help answer the question? Well, I did, I did make reference um, in my book, Killing the Competition, to one sociological study that was looking at effects of inequality on mortality generally. And the notion that inequality affects mortality generally yeah. is mediated by what you were talking about, about health effects. The idea that, um, you know, stresses and fraught social comparisons produce... Um, greater vulnerability to stress-related diseases, and, and in fact, many diseases, most diseases maybe even are stress-related in their ultimate impacts on people. Um, so there's this one sociological study uh, by a guy named Zheng in Ohio State, which sought effects of economic inequality on mortality in general, and came to the conclusion that there, the, the effects were lagged, that the maximum impact on current mortality was inequality seven years ago, which sounds kind of funny, but he had analyses which seemed to show, and, and I'm, I'm a bit wary about the legitimacy of these analyses, but they seem to me to show, they seem to show to him that inequality of a few years ago affects the chance that you'll die now, um, net of the effects of, you know, age and sex and, and other predictors of mortality, and that there's sort of the cumulative consequences of many years of, immort- of of past inequality. So seven years ago was the worst, but six and eight also mattered additively. Five years ago and nine years ago also mattered additively. Ten years ago also mattered. So that how bad the inequality was in your past seems to affect your likelihood of dying now. The effects of violence haven't, haven't been looked at. It's hard to figure out how you could get a decent enough data set to do that right, but, but I don't think it's impossible. Okay, so so with regards to health effects, so I'm going to lay out a, an account of them, and, and you can tell me what you think about this. All right, so uh, your 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 brain 
is always trying to calculate to some degree how good things are going for you. And that's an extraordinarily difficult calculation because life is uncertain and ultimately uncertain and it's difficult to predict the future except perhaps by using the past as a marker. And so you, what seems to happen is that our nervous and our nervous systems are always interested in how prepared we should be for emergency at any given moment. And as far as I can tell, there, there are a number of ways that we calibrate that. One is baseline levels of trait neuroticism. So that's sensitivity to anxiety and uncertainty and emotional pain. And so you seem to be born, roughly speaking, at, a, at, at, an, at your uh, average level of neuroticism, which can vary substantially between people. It can be also adjusted at puberty. And then the environment can move you in one direction or another. So, for example, if you have a highly anxious child and you encourage them to go out and explore, then you can move them towards the normal range. Uh, Jerry Kagan has demonstrated that quite nicely. Okay, so the first, the first estimate of how worried you should be about the future is like genetic roll of the dice. Some people will be born extraordinarily worried, roughly speaking, and some people will be born hardly worried at all, and then that can be modified by the, by the particulars of the social environment. Right. So then the next thing that seems to me to be part of the calculation is comparison. How well are you doing compared to others? Yeah. And that, that seems to be adjusted by mechanisms that associate perceived social status with serotonin, serotonergic activity, such okay. that as you move up a dominance hierarchy, your, your serotonin levels rise so that your impulsivity, which would be partly sensitive, sensitivity to immediate reward, declines, and so does your sensitivity to negative emotion. Whereas if you plummet down to the bottom of a hierarchy, you start to become more reward-seeking and also more anxious. And the reason for that, more anxious, and is because the bottom of the dominance hierarchy actually is a more dangerous place to be because you don't have access to, you don't have reliable access as reliable to shelter or food or mating resources or health care. And you even see this in birds, you know. So 